great. Leslie Hervey, clerk to the board. Good afternoon, I'm County Commissioner Denise Driehaus. Jeff Aluto, County Administrator. Oh, I was waiting for Michael to say, Michael Freeman. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, would you like to introduce yourself, Vice President? Commissioner Alicia Reese. Thank you, and I'm Stephanie Summerall Dumas, President of the Hamilton County Board of County Commissioners. Um, and there is uh, Michael Friedman, our legal person. So we will get started um, for our agenda today. Um, I would like to first uh, have a moment of silence for Cindy Fazio, who uh, has worked very diligently uh, with the prosecutor's office and for many years has been very helpful to Hamilton County on many projects, many issues, uh, much recommendations to our board. I, I did get a chance to meet her and I'm sure other people have had uh, more time with her than I have, but it was a sudden death and we certainly want to have a moment of uh, silence for her. Amen. Thank you. Um, well, let's get to work. We've got quite a few things on our agenda. First item on our agenda is COVID-19 comprehensive update. Commissioner Greg Kesterman. Well, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to provide another update. Today, I'd like to uh, start just with a quick slide about data. I've seen a lot of reporting over the last seven days that um, is not perfectly accurate, and I just wanna make sure folks understand how the data currently is being managed. And so, um, first and foremost, all of the data sets, because COVID has kind of calmed down in our community, state, and nation, the majority of the data sets are now reported on a weekly basis. Typically, um, they are aligning on Thursday at 2 p.m. That data is being released, but that does cause some delay in, in some of the data that we are seeing. In addition, the community tool that, that I show in my slide deck, the map, that is CDC data. Here locally, though, we kind of recreate that map, and I put that into my pres presentation. That recreation is done through the Health Collaborative, Health Collaborative and through experts at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. That data comes straight from ODH and is pushed to CDC. So um, the reason why that's important is here locally, we live in a tri-state, and so having this kind of regional look at the data which comes from a federal source has been helpful for standardizing that data. In addition, here locally, probably the most key metric that we've talked about throughout the pandemic has really been our capacity for our hospital systems and the ICU. That data is updated daily. And so we have a very clean, clear snapshot of what's happening in our community. So for example, if you think about the BA2 variant moving through our community, the first thing we're looking for is do we have capacity? And so in a few moments, I'll share a slide that shows hospital data on the decrease. And that's a perfect snapshot of what is happening. Um, in addition, um, I just want to continue to say that I think here in Hamilton County, we have had the best data sources of any spot in Ohio. We're lucky to have Cincinnati Children's Hospital here who has been providing a lot of support to our region as well as the Health Collaborative. So anyway, um, and final, the final point up there is because the commissioners throughout the pandemic have funded this testing with PCR testing, here locally I think we have the best snapshot into actual test data as well. And that's a, a contribution that, that you have made to this pandemic as well as many, many, many other things. So with that, I will uh, dive into my normal set of slides and um, point out that we are still seeing COVID in our community, although it seems still fairly much in control. I believe two weeks ago when I was here, we were about 700 active cases. Today, we are about 900 active cases. So a slight increase, but nothing, nothing alarming at this moment in time. Same thing, our cases, when you look at them over time, today we are about 55 cases per day, which is um, really of no concern. And the population, when you see how it's spread throughout the county, there's really no one specific area of concern. Um, there are a couple spots that orange being the areas of slightly higher concentration, but um, really, once again, these are fairly low numbers overall. Percent positivity for the region is at 1.9% positive, which is very low. Our county is slightly higher, I believe, at about 2.3%. And then, as already alluded, um, with regards to hospitalizations, today we are at 68 individuals within our region's hospital systems, 
eight individuals, which is a very low number within our ICU, and six individuals on ventilators. A more zoomed in view of those two data points, the hospital and the ICU, you can see that the slope is very uh, little or low right now, but both are either on the decline or, or fairly stable. So all really great metrics from my perspective. The, uh, as mentioned many times here in this meeting as well, you know, the ICU numbers really um, ultimately translate into deaths in our community. And right now we are seeing between zero and two deaths per day. So very, very much things seem to be in control and at a much more reasonable level. We continue to have a lot of progress with vaccinations um, here in Hamilton County. Those over the age of 30 have hit that national benchmark of 70%, which is really phenomenal. Our clinics, a few weeks ago before the boosters uh, started, our clinics were really slow. We were only vaccinating maybe 50 people a week at all of our clinics. Now that boosters are happening, it's somewhere closer to 250 and 300 people are coming into our vaccination clinics and getting boosted. We continue to offer a homebound program. So if there's folks in our community that have loved ones that need us to come to them, um, they can visit our website and there's a way to get, to get yourself vaccinated. I have shared this also publicly, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about federal funding for testing and vaccinations going away and that leaves some gaps for those who are uninsured. Once again, here in Hamilton County, thanks to the commissioner's uh, testing program, there is testing available for those who are uninsured as well as our vaccine clinics are available for those uninsured. So thanks to the work of our community, um, everyone, even those who don't have access to health insurance can continue to get those services at no charge. Um, so the, the two maps then related to the CDC and how we are doing as a community, Hamilton County continues to remain yellow or um, low for case incidents with regards to COVID. We are at 38 individuals per 100,000 with COVID-19 and our percent positivity as mentioned is at 2.3%. And that translates into us being green or low for community transmission. All of Southwest Ohio as can be seen on the map is low. All of Ohio at this time is low. And then the last two slides I have, you know, you hear a lot of conversation about the BA2 variant here in the United States being the predominant variant. And that is accurate. Um, the pink, the light pink represents the BA2 variant coming into our community and kind of taking hold. And one other way to look at that is, is geographically, we are part of region five and about 85% of the new cases are estimated to be the BA2 variant. And so after seeing all of the data that I just presented, um, the question I get asked most often is, do we need to worry about it? And yes, COVID is still in our community and we still need to be careful, but it seems that the BA2, whether it's because we're at such a high level of vaccination or we had a decent amount of Omicron in our community, it seems to not be having a significant impact on our residents, which is great news. Those are my slides for today. I'm happy to dive in on anything or take any questions. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, I'm gonna digress for a, a minute, um, if I may. Um, first of all, I wanted to welcome all the beautiful faces in the audience, it's so nice to have people here. And also, um, when we talked, when I talked about Cindy Fazio, I wanted to open it up for other commissioners or um, prosecutor's office to make comments. So I think it was necessary to say that before questions began for you to let people know that I'm going to allow everybody to say what they need to say as it relates to her. So I'll open it up right now for questions as it relates to uh, Greg's presentation. Vice President Reese. Uh, thank you. Uh, recently, the uh, mass mandate is uh, gone. Um, I just saw for uh, people who are flying. Uh, have you received anything from the CDC regarding that? And is there anything we need to, uh, will this have any impact as people are flying now with no mask and hey, we're going to different places and coming back? Uh, is, was there any research or anything that came out about that? So a couple things are at play. One is the reason why the change occurred was related to a court order. And um, as a result, some airlines are lifting their requirements, some airports are lifting their requirement, including what I understand to be CVG, as well as some mass transit system. So I would always encourage people before you travel, I would still encourage you to put a mask in your pocket just so you have it handy if your air carrier or the airport that you're landing at requires masks, you're prepared. 
Um, as far as am I concerned or is there any data um, to support it? You know, for quite some time, about a month and a half, we have been living under the new COVID community transmission maps. And so um, we are following the CDC guidance already. Personally, if you hop into a crowded space with a bunch of unknown people that, that you don't know if they're sick or not, wearing a mask can't hurt, but it's no longer recommended by the CDC. So I think each individual has to make a decision based on their own health and their own risks. You know, masks do slow the spread of community transmission of all infectious diseases that are spread airborne. And so if you're heading to Florida for a fun trip and you don't want to get a cold, a flu, or COVID, a mask can reduce your risk. So really, it's just a matter of you making an individual choice at this point. And also, um, the COVID cards, there are people who have asked about that, so I wanted you to kind of talk about that, because there are some places you go, they want to see your COVID card. Some people have asked, do I get rid of it now? Can you give advice for people who are watching or in or here? Yeah, so certainly it seems that most local places do not require proof of vaccination, but sometimes when you travel or some places abroad do require um, proof of vaccination before you travel or uh, attend an event. So I would recommend folks hold on to that card if you have it. If you happen to have lost one and know you're traveling somewhere that requires it, I would recommend you visit our website and we do print them out for free for you. Our website is hcph.org. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, for being here. Um, I, I don't really have a question so much as uh, a comment related to the vaccine clinic at the Board of Elections. My mom and I traveled up yesterday afternoon and got boosted. My arm is killing me, but no other symptoms, so that's good. Uh, my mom, of course, is fine, and she's always been fine throughout this whole process, but it was so easy uh, to go in and get the booster. Your staff could not have been nicer. Um, they were just delightful all the way through the process. And so thank you to you and your team for continuing to have such a positive attitude. When someone walks through the door, they're so excited that we're there to get the booster. And then we went to vote, uh, which was right on the other side of the room, and they were very uh, kind as well. So um, thank you for just being so diligent about the work that you're doing and making sure that we all have access to vaccine. I mean, the county played a part, but you're, the, the public health department really was the one that, that took the bull by the horns. And I think um, the numbers of vaccinations, um, having the 70 to 74 year old population up to 96% is really phenomenal and a credit to you and your team. So I just wanna say thank you to you. Um, thank you for your constant diligence on this issue. And we look forward to continuing to partner with you on this. Thank you. I'll take that feedback back to the team as well. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask if anyone else wanted to make a comment as it relates to Cindy Fazio and their work with her. Um, Vice President Reese. Uh, I didn't get a, a long time to work with her, uh, but I do want to uh, send prayers out to her, her family. Um, I think maybe my second day on the job, she came on, I met her by Zoom and mm -hmm. You know, the good thing she said is solved, and it just it was the easiest uh, decision that I had to make. All we had to say is yes, she's already negotiated. She got it solved and moving forward. So, uh, but just want to, you know, pray for the family. Um, whenever you lose someone uh, and you're still here, uh, certainly uh, just want to keep the family in prayers for, for strength uh, and to keep her, her memory and, and legacy uh, alive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was going to actually mention Cindy as we talked about the American Rescue Plan, but thank you for the opportunity at the top of the meeting here. Um, because Cindy was the one that when we were going through the very beginning of the pandemic and we had those co uh, the CARES dollars available to us and we were trying desperately to figure out what the community need was and push those dollars out the door for individuals and small businesses and just the relief that we were able to provide uh, through those dollars from the federal government. Cindy Fazio was the one in the prosecutor's office that was really working hard to accelerate the process. Uh, amongst others, I mean, over here, Holly Christman, Bridget Doherty, Jeff Aluto, we had many, many people working on this, but Cindy was a constant partner 
from the prosecutor's office knowing how desperate we were to get the money out as quickly as we could. So um, I think we all mourn her loss. She was uh, also a very friendly, smiling face whenever she came over. She used to bring flowers. She had uh, lovely uh, gardens in her yard and she brought peonies over and they were just gorgeous and fragrant and just really lifted everybody's spirits during a really weird time uh, during COVID. So um, I, I appreciate again uh, the opportunity to talk about Cindy, but she will be sorely missed by us and I'm sure the prosecutor's office mm -hmm. as well. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Okay, we will move forward. Um, item number two, Hamilton County Arts and Cultural Relief Grants. Uh, President CEO of Arts Wave, come forward. <laughs> yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alicia Kintner. Okay. I'm President and CEO of Arts Wave, and I'm here today on behalf of 53 arts and cultural organizations to say thank you to all of you for making $2 million available for arts and cultural relief in Hamilton County through the American Rescue Plan. And of course, this is on top of support that you provided through the CARES Act, as you alluded to, Commissioner Driehaus. Uh, we are really happy to say that live arts are back in Hamilton County, and you had a little something to do with that. So thank you again. In this latest round of grant making uh, that ArtsWave administered on your behalf, 53 organizations are receiving uh, grants 25% of these organizations had not accessed, for one reason or another, prior federal relief aid. So we have reached uh, additional new organizations with this, as well as bolstered our uh, major regional cultural assets and helped to steady the community arts landscape. The funds, uh, of course, benefited our center city, but also reached into communities outside of the Central Business District and Cincinnati into other parts of the county. So it was very widespread support uh, felt throughout our neighborhoods. The average grant was $36,000, but they ranged from $1,000 all the way to $150,000 based on uh, evidence of loss related to the pandemic, uh, recovery costs that organizations are experiencing, and pre-pandemic revenue and size. So we think it was an equitable process, and um, we're very proud and glad to be able to make these investments in the resiliency of our arts mm -hmm. and cultural landscape here in Hamilton County. I, I want to share some brand new data, which we're still sort of digesting now, but with you today that shows just how important restoring the county's arts organizations to fiscal health is, and how devastating the pandemic has been for them. This is a new study on the economic contribution of Ohio's arts and creative industries conducted by Bowling Green State University on behalf of Ohio's Citizens for the Arts. They looked at both pre-pandemic uh, impact of the state's and our county's arts economic impact and the pandemic effects. So just a couple of data points. We know that jobs were lost in the arts because of the pandemic, but now we know how, how many. 25% of the arts and culture workforce saw their jobs disappear during COVID versus just 4% in all other industry groups in Hamilton County. So six times as many nonprofit arts and culture jobs were lost than in other industries, six times as many. Mm -hmm. And in the motion picture film industry, that number is even higher at 29%. And of course, that has huge economic impact for our county. So real personal human losses through the pandemic, as we know. And of course, we have long said that artists had the highest percentage of unemployment uh, statewide and even across the country. Also, the economic impact of the arts generated by creative industries, so that includes nonprofit arts and culture, but also all the creative businesses um, such as advertising, architecture, graphic design, production, all the things that's, that have shared employees with the nonprofits and that also support our corporate sector. The economic impact of the creative industries in Hamilton County declined by 14% from 2019 to 2020 versus 4.5% in all other industries. So about three times as much reduction in economic impact in the arts than were felt in other industry groups. We're gonna hear some testimony in just a moment about the 
human toll of the pandemic and the positive benefits of your support from my colleagues uh, at Biokoto, the Holocaust and Humanity Center, and the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. But first, I want to share some positive stats from the same study that point us to opportunities for the future, I believe. Hamilton County leads the state as home to 31% of Ohio's creative industry jobs. 31%, which is super, super cool. Mm. We support 24% of arts payroll in Ohio, contribute 22% of arts impact on the state's economy, and generate the highest ancillary value uh, of any other region, including Columbus, Cleveland, Toledo, et cetera. Across the state and across the country, our peer and competitive regions are all trying to stabilize their proven arts and cultural assets as economic drivers tax dollars, jobs, reputation, the ability to attract talent to our corporate partners. These are all things to gain by the recovery of the arts and culture sector. Uh, a quick recovery, which we are beginning to see with your support. So if I'm not overstepping, I'd like to suggest that we commit together to growing this creative economy here in Hamilton County for the future of our county, not just stabilizing it, but let's grow it. Let's figure out how to have annual support for the arts in the county's budget with ArtsWave continuing to help administer for equitable and optimal impact throughout our communities for the people of Ham Hamilton County and all the rich benefits that the arts provide our residents. Thank you. I'm happy Thank to you. take questions yeah. or turn it over to Fumi Ajamufwa from Biopito. Yeah, well, we'll do that, do that? yeah. Uh-huh. Fumi, thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Good yeah. afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Fumi Ajamufwa. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, and I'm the programs coordinator and also a teaching and performing artist at B. Okoto Drum and Dance Theater. Hmm. So B. Okoto Drum and Dance Theater actually operates the, uh, an authentic African cultural center in the greater Cincinnati region. We have programs for kids, K through 12, young professionals, adults, I mean, like, we cut across all ages. Our programming, you know, before the pandemic, normally would be like, you know, under a deluge of um, inquiries, bookings and all. We travel around the states to, you know, go present, do residencies, perform. Actually, our mission is to engage, to teach people about the rich culture of Africa. And these kids, when we come in contact with them, it's like first time meeting someone from Africa. We've had people, you know, these kids asking questions like, really, are you from Africa? Do people live in houses? <laughs> yes. Do you have children? Do they go to schools? Like, yes, we actually do. And then I like move close to some of them and like, feel me. And then they touch me. Do I look different from you? Then they're like, no. Well, of course, my accent, yes. And of course we make them, you know, we teach them drum patterns. We're not just teaching them, we're not razzmatizing them. We're actually making them understand these things, you know. Teaching them drumming has to do with calculations, which helps mathematics, you know, you know, measuring time. And then the fact that they're looking at all these drums and all the rhythms and at first they're like, no, I can't do this. But then you take your time and then you teach them. They become so confident and then they actually help one another. Mm -hmm. And then you can see the smiles on them and then truly appreciating other people from other cultures who are not like them. Mm -hmm. And then we tell them stories about these cultures that we're telling them. Say, so like you're teaching a dance from Guinea. You're telling them the story about the dance. So say like Kakilambe. Kakilambe is a dance that usually, you know, in, in the community when everyone is in unity, you know, like you're good and everything and then you pray to the gods for harvest. When you plant your seed, of course, you're expecting the rains to come and then the rains come. So we tell the kids, so say like, you're good boys and girls in school, you don't bully one another, like you listen to your teachers. At, you know, Thanksgiving, what do you get? At Christmas, and then they were like, goodies, yes. So that's just the same thing, like comparing other cultures. So now when the pandemic hit, we couldn't do most of these things. Actually, it stopped because we couldn't travel. There were restrictions and everything. We had bookings that were canceled. We lost two of our um, artists. And the core of our program is, you know, the artists. They are the ones who go out to, you know, interact with everyone that we come in contact with. So that hit a lot. 
we were having difficulty paying our mortgages. Keeping the lights on, that was a problem. <laughs> so, but then we grant money like this from the Hamilton County. It would help us, you know, retain or hire at least two teaching and performing artists to be able to continue our mission. This means so much to us. It's a passion. We have seen the growth in it. Recently, our programming has become staple in Cincinnati Public Schools, mm. especially at, you know, during the summer enrichment program. Right now, we have um, sessions booked with them. Almost all the schools in CPS, um, in Cincinnati, want us to come to their school because they've heard so much about our programming and they have they know the positive things it has on these kids and not just the kids alone you know even the teachers too things they never know you know mm -hmm. there's always been misinformation back you know out there but ours is to set it right you know when make you understand that we're not so much different from one another mm -hmm. even though we're different in skin color hair texture and all of that so grant money is like this means a lot to us so much and that's why i'm here today to say thank you because mm -hmm. i'm gonna say again it's gonna we will be able to hire two more artists to be able to continue our programming we'll be able to pay our mortgage because that's a lot every month we're like the first of the next month is going to be a problem what do we do do we need to call them to just you know like give us a little time paying bills is also one other aspect that we've been you know, struggling with. So this means a lot to us. And I just want to say thank you again. Mm -hmm. We're in Cincinnati to share the rich African culture, to engage, to entertain, okay? So thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Fumi, and I am eager to come 10 a.m. Saturday morning to be a Kodo with my daughter. I'm Sarah Weiss. I'm the director of the Nancy and David Wolf Holocaust and Humanity Center, uh, located at Union Terminal, and I want to add my gratitude on behalf of our board and volunteers and the remaining survivors in our community for helping us during this uh, impossible time. As, as you know, thanks to really uh, the partnership um, with Hamilton County on the renovation of Union Terminal, we opened our new museum in January 2019, just a year before the pandemic hit. We were just finding our bearings in this new home with this museum dedicated to ensuring the lessons of the Holocaust inspire action today, bringing in people from our greater Cincinnati community, Hamilton County, and beyond uh, when the pandemic hit. Of course, um, like so many other organizations, arts and cultural organizations, we had to cancel more than 200 programs. Um, tours, school groups, all kinds of experiences. Um, we, we lost about 80% of our um, earned income revenue um, and our f fundraisers, which was a big um, portion of our budget, were in-person fundraisers. So we had to cancel those and figure out how to raise the dollars. Um, this funding cannot be understated in helping us weather the storm of the pandemic and now coming out towards the other side. Like many organizations, we created an enormous digital footprint and now we're bringing people back into the building. School groups are coming back in huge numbers, but we couldn't do this without your support. Um, we could all open the, the front page of our newspapers and realize, unfortunately, the relevance of the work that we're doing to educate about um, history, the important roles it plays, certainly in our, our present as well as, sadly, the future. Um, and all these lessons are needed now more than ever, and we can't thank you enough for helping to ensure that the citizens of Hamilton County and beyond will learn from the work of our museum, and that we'll be able to partner with our community organizations, arts partners, Arts Waves, the Cincinnati Ballet, uh, the Cincinnati Museum Center, the Freedom Center, who, who you'll hear from in a moment, um, and bring so many important cultural experiences to our community for years to come, thanks to the support um, that we've been given that is really um, helping us uh, maintain the organizational capacity to move into uh, the next phase of our work and to, as Alicia set forth, grow this important work for our community. So thank you. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Woody. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Woody Keon. It's my honor to serve as president of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. Uh, on behalf of our direct board of directors, I come before you today to share the, how vital the ARP grant funding has been to the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. This funding has basically been crucial in enabling the Freedom Center to continue operations and to serve citizens of Hamilton County with unique cultural learning experiences. Because of this funding, we built much needed organizational capacity and retain our critical staff to operate effectively in today's competitive environment, allowing us to be an educator and resource on critical topics at a time when inequities and cultural tensions have stressed our communities. Specifically, uh, this grant provided supplemental funds that enabled the Freedom Center to add the crucial roles of museum curator, exhibit content developer, and digital and social content manager. Two of, two of these three positions were necessary to meet reaccreditation re standards, an honor we were successfully awarded just this past March, making us part of just 6% of accredited museums nationally. Only 6% of people are in this category, museums in our category. The third position was needed to better communicate, engage, and engage with our audiences on topics of great importance regarding equity and inclusion which is a critical role as disinformation poses serious threats to productive engagement and education. The retention of our experienced staff allowed us to create new programming concepts and models. For example, we collaborated with ArtsWave on the Black and Brown Artists Exhibition. We enhanced and expanded our, our program offerings, such as the Unmasking Reality series that deals with systemic racial inequities in health, policing, voting rights, education, and more. ARP funding for arts and cultural organizations like the Freedom Center greatly enhances our ability to promote social justice for all by better educating people on systemic inequities and inspiring personal and collective action, calls to action. It encourages Ohioans to reflect on the purpose and power of the Underground Railroad, the nation's first most diverse social justice movement. It provides economic benefit to Hamilton County by attracting increased tourism and visitors to learn firsthand about the Underground Railroad, which is a museum, uh, as a museum we were just recognized as one of the top three museums in USA Today's 10 Best Reader's Choice Awards for the second year in a row. And it also allows us to attract and retain talent by cultivating the vibrancy of our county as only arts and cultural organizations can do, which encourages employees to move their families here during their career journey. It improves human relations across the county and regions through collaborative, collaborative activities. The Freedom Center invites members of this committee, this commission and the staff to visit the museum to learn the power of being a conductor as we move forward to the fight for freedom by promoting social justice for all. Thank you for all you've done and I appreciate all the support you provided. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alicia, and the other speakers that came forth. Uh, we um, purposely, as we received the ARPA money, we decided that uh, the tangible things that you can see, housing and shelter and small businesses and nonprofits, uh, that we wanted to give money toward those efforts. But we also realized that um, this, uh, arts, and uh, arts and cultural uh, projects are essential to the survival of our county because you talk about mental health. And um, when we look at that social and emotional impact that people uh, and children and adults are involved in, it really reflects the flavor of Hamilton County. It reduces the violence. Uh, it ha gives people uh, things to let their, uh, I was thinking about dancing. I started to say, can you show me some moves? Um, and then I read, she said, no, and then, uh, uh, and then Alicia mentioned about 31% reduction in motion pictures. I'm still waiting for my call back, you know. <laughs> but um, just seriously, um, we knew that this was a stone we had to turn over and make sure people say, you're giving the arts and culture events and we have other needs. Well, this is a need for many people uh, to be able to express themselves and to make our county even better. So I thank you all for coming. I'm glad we had somewhat of an impact um, and we'll certainly uh, work on trying to help in the future however we can. So thank you so much. I'll open it up for Vice President Reese. Thank you um, and thank you uh, Alicia. Great name. I keep hearing Alicia. I'm like <laughs> Thank you uh, for, for all that you do 
uh, in the arts and culture space uh, through Arts Wave. Uh, let me just say that um, the arts is economic development. Uh, the arts is the fabric of what makes our county unique. Um, I served as the deputy director of tourism at the state of Ohio. And I remember I had to go to all 88 counties and market everything. <laughs> I learned a lot. I, I was, had to market it all. But I saw so many other communities that didn't have what we have here, and I had a greater appreciation. Uh, I was in Columbus when they were losing the symphony, and that was a huge thing, and I couldn't imagine not having a symphony. Um, I went to other areas that didn't have a lot of the arts that we have here, and I began to be a little more thankful for uh, coming from uh, Hamilton County and being born in Cincinnati because we have these things and we have uh, diversity of the arts throughout uh, the county. And I remember serving uh, on city council uh, and I remember we were doing the arts and we said, I said, wait a minute, we wanna have the arts not just in downtown Cincinnati, let's get it out into the neighborhoods. And we were the first to put money toward the Kennedy Heights Arts Center. Uh, which has grown uh, by leaps and bounds, and of course then in Price Hill. And so we started to expand that footprint of the arts throughout, no matter where you live, no matter what your zip code is, you have access uh, because we have super talented artists throughout and creative folks throughout this community. Um, I'm very excited that here uh, we're, we're building a uh, Cincinnati Black Music Walk of Fame that will highlight uh, folks who may have started local, but now have been selling records global, and we'll be able to recapture our own history and have an interactive uh, walk of fame that uh, everyone can enjoy for free. Uh, today, what we see is that artists are small businesses. They are, uh, the artists pay taxes, uh, they contribute to uh, the local economy, they um, certainly bring in tourism, as they've talked about, tourism dollars that come in here, and we certainly want people to come here for tourism and book those hotels. I put that plug in. Uh, we have great nonprofits that have been uh, organized for many years, and some are, that are formed to make sure that the arts can get to uh, all walks of life at a reasonable cost. And so those nonprofits certainly got hit very hard because you're not immune from paying gas and electric bills and water bills and, and uh, telephone, you have expenses and staffing. And it creates jobs. A lot of people, uh, when we shut down, uh, the Aronoff and Ensemble Theater and so many others, people that work in that space, people didn't think about, they were laid off. Uh, uh, they didn't, where they're gonna get their income. Um, and they have been devastatedly affected by the close of these facilities over that time span. Uh, so COVID has definitely hit economically the arts community like everyone else. With that, uh, I wanna say that those who are watching, the way that the county operates is that we fund uh, an administrator to, we, we fund the money then we get an administrator, and the administrator does the grants. And so sometimes you may not see, they say, well, what did the county do for the arts? And I wanna make sure it gets down. Uh, we partnered with uh, Arts Wave to get Arts Wave the money. I think it's been over $5 million with two waves, <laughs> CARES and American Rescue. So to the arts community, this board uh, certainly partnered with that. And then the fund, we funded your funder and the funding got down to the people. Um, and that's what's so important. With that, I just want to take a minute uh, to name some of the people that did receive these awards because I know many people support these organizations. Uh, Mercantile Library, Art Academy of Cincinnati, Cincinnati Memorial Hall Society, Clifton Cultural Arts Center, Film Cincinnati, Wyoming Fine Arts Center, Arts and Humanities Resource Center for Older Adults, uh, and they go by the name Creative Aging Cincinnati, Arts Connect, Cincinnati Music Accelerator, Sharonville Fine Arts Center, Cincinnati Black Theater Company, Cincinnati Choral Society, Professional Artistic Research Projects. These were the new 
who hadn't gotten grants before, new or, uh, so, uh, organizations. And then we go into the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra, Cincinnati Arts Association, the Aronoff for the Arts, Cincinnati Music Hall, Cincinnati Ballet, Cincinnati Playhouse in the Park, Cincinnati Landmark Productions, Cincinnati Music Festival Association, known as the May Festival, Cincinnati Opera, Cincinnati Shakespeare Company, Ensemble Theater of Cincinnati, the Children's Theater of Cincinnati, Inc. By the way, The Wiz is, was phenomenal. Uh, Kennedy Heights Art Center, Price Hill Wheel, World, Word Play, Cincy, Cincinnati Chamber Orchestra, Cincinnati Youth uh, Choir, Elements, uh, Music Resource Center, Visionaries Plus Voices, Vocal Arts Ensemble of Cincinnati, No Theater of Cincinnati, Mutual Dance Theater and Arts Center. And this is in addition to the three people that you heard from today. I won't say their names again. Cincinnati Boy Choir, uh, D.E. De La Dance Company, uh, uh, Learning Through Art, Inc., Linton Chamber Music, Young Professionals Choral Collective, American Legacy Theater, Queen City Opera, Revolution Dance Theater, Cincinnati Museum Center, Cincinnati Art Museum, Art Opportunities, Inc., DBAS Arts Work, we are very familiar with them, Contemporary Arts Center, um, National, of course, we already had the Underground Railroad Freedom Center, Taft Museum of Art, American Sign Museum, um, Manifest uh, Creative Research Gallery, Wave Pool Gallery. A lot of people uh, we were able to stretch these dollars to fill in the gap, to keep them going, and uh, just want to say great job and uh, thank my colleagues, all of us, uh, for moving forward with the arts. The arts are here to stay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, and as Alicia mentioned, there are 53 um, that were assisted by this program at $1.95 million. So it's not a small thing. And it's very important that, as you were saying, that we had new people had never received anything. So we were really kind of loud. Uh, we advocated quite a bit to look for the ones that have never gotten any money before. Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you. Um, Thank you to ArtsWave for administering this grant. Um, I know it's a complicated process and it can be difficult because you're trying to be as fair as possible and be as inclusive as possible to try to hit as many organizations as you can. So thank you so much for your efforts there and making the process open and fair. Um, and then I, I also just wanted to note that, you know, there were some industries that were decimated during, through COVID. The arts industry was one of them. Tourism was the other one that, that are so obviously reliant on people coming into the facility in order to do what you do. And so um, I think this commission noted that we needed to do something here. Uh, we did it through CARES and we've now done it through the American Rescue Plan. I do want to note, and, and we're going to be talking a lot about the federal money that has come down to the county, and it is the federal money. I mean, thank goodness for our federal partners for allowing us to this capacity to do this. But, um, you know, as has been said, the arts are um, part of the fabric of this community. It's so important that you thrive and so we are happy to be partners in trying to help you um, get back up and running as we move into this next phase of whatever we're going through uh, right now with COVID um, but thank you so much for your participation and thank you for sharing your stories with us thank you and Alicia on a personal note uh, someone told me to call ArtsWave if I needed an illustrator because I'm writing a book and I was overwhelmed with the number of some through DAP through UC but the number of artists and how talented they are and hoping that they all get recognized in some way to to use their gifts so I was able to find someone there to, to help me with my book so I thank you for that okay we'll move forward thank you all for coming I still would like to see a little bit. No, <laughs> she said, no, I'm out of here. You look beautiful too, yeah. Okay, we'll move on to item number three, uh, resolution reappointing um, members to the Community Development Advisory Committee. I don't know if any of those members are here that are being reappointed or appointed, do you know? No, ma'am. They're not here. Okay. Would you like to speak to it first? Sure. Real okay. quickly, uh -huh. uh, Steve Johns, Assistant Director of Planning and Development. Uh, the CDAC, the Community Development Advisory Committee, is a group of individuals that help us with many of the HUD-funded programs that we have, particularly the nonprofit grant and also some of our affordable housing through the HOME program. 
Uh, so this is a group that represents a pretty wide cross-section of our community, folks from the jurisdictions, folks from private sector, uh, folks that are in the nonprofit uh, sector. So uh, this is just something we work through uh, year to year. These are three-year terms. We have a great slate of folks uh, in front of you today. Um, two new members, Amber David from the Kroger Company is going to be joining the CDAC. Uh, she has expertise in economic development. And Daniel Blaylock uh, from the city of Springdale. He's one of their uh, housing officers there, so he'll help us with many of the housing uh, pieces. And then we have two uh, renewing members, uh, Kathleen Kennedy with Springfield Township. She's their assistant director up there, assistant administrator, I should say. And Nick DiNardo, he's the head of legal aid. So another good group, crew to help us make recommendations for those HUD-funded programs, and we appreciate you to take the time to uh, put them back on the CDAC. Thank you so much. We're always excited when we're able to fill those vacancies, and there are more vacancies for anyone who's listening. Um, any comments as it relates to the resolution? Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. I'd like to Thank make a motion to approve resolution number three. Second. Commissioner Summer Dumas? Yes. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes. Thank you so much. Okay, our next item on the agenda, American Rescue Plan. I think, uh, Jeff, you're going to make a few comments? Uh, just you... very briefly, as Holly's uh, preparing the, uh, the slides up, up here, um, as we just talked about in the, with the last item, related, or the item before last related to the arts, there's so much work uh, that I think the county has to be, and so much reason for the county to be proud of the work it's done over the past uh, several years. So much stuff that has happened in, in some really terrible times. Uh, but not the the least of which is the work that we've done distributing these, this federal assistance um, out into the community. And it used to be when we would would thank people, we would thank a very small team of folks who did this. By now, I think the number of people who have their fingerprints on this in the county is so widespread that it would be very difficult to thank everyone. But I do just want to thank, as Holly's getting ready to present here, I just want to thank all the staff. Uh, who'd had anything at all to do with this. Thank our stakeholders out in the community. Um, by the time we're done, we're going to have, have put um, about a third of a billion dollars out into the community, assisting with everything from uh, keeping small businesses open to housing the homeless uh, to providing testing out in the community. We heard about some of the, the arts funding, nonprofits, food banks, um, the, uh, keeping people in their homes through rent and utility assistance, just the amount of stuff that this board and the county has done um, at the end of the day uh, is just absolutely incredible. Um, so Holly's going to lay out now the recommendations for the American Rescue Plan, which was after the CARES Act, the second um, uh, big stimulus plan that, uh, that local governments received from, from the federal government. This will show how this work is going to continue over the next several years. Um, we, as the board knows, were very uh, intentional and very deliberative about how we wanted to do this and how we wanted to get it out there because we wanted to make sure we got this right under the understanding that 10 years from now, when we look back, the community has the right to expect that if we do hit another shock like a pandemic, et cetera, that this federal funding that we've received was used to make this community um, in the long run more resilient and stronger to respond uh, in the future. So that's the premise behind the, the presentation today. I want to thank Holly for all of her work on this and turn it over to her, to her now for the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank Hello. you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, um, to reiterate, um, Administrator Aludo, I'm really excited to be here today to give you an update on uh, current American Rescue Plan programs, but the majority of the presentation will be spent talking about uh, recommendations for some remaining funds we have under ARPA that were informed through um, stakeholder groups. So just for those listening at home, just a reminder, um, Hamilton County is the recipient of $158 million in American Rescue Plan funding. Um, those funds are to be used in four broad areas as identified by the federal government. Um, one is to respond to the public health emergency as well as its economic impacts. Um, we are also able to use it to provide premium pay for eligible employees for essential work. We can use it for revenue reduction and we can use it to make necessary improvements to water, sewer, or broadband improvements. So, when we were first notified of this funding in 2021, just to refresh everyone's memory, the board embarked on a public um, process that included four stakeholder uh, input sessions involving both internal and external organizations. 
and we really wanted them to give us um, ideas on what are the community needs as a result of the pandemic. So based on this input, um, we put together a draft plan, um, probably May of last year. The board then held two public hearings last May of 20, May 25th and 27th of 2021. We revised the plan a bit based on that feedback. And last July 1st, the board did approve that allocation plan of the $158 million. Um, so that plan, which was amended a couple times for some, some miscellaneous expenses, um, was four big primary buckets. One, of course, 24 and a half million for public health systems. That includes um, things like mental health, uh, some funding to help move the Cincinnati Police Department gun range. We also have all of our efforts related to the 513 relief bus and outreach related to that, as well as uh, mental health and some emergent needs. We also have 40 million in there for county finances and operations, the bulk of which is used for revenue replacement uh, in the amount of $32 million. We have 19 million for infrastructure, which is up to 10 for broadband and nine for sewer. And we have the bulk of our funding is, is um, focused on addressing the negative economic impacts. And the biggest chunk of that is devoted to housing. So since the board approved that plan back in July, we have been pretty busy at work getting those, many of those programs underway. You've heard a lot of, um, about the results today. This is just a snapshot. And I do just wanna point just a couple of them out to you. Um, first of all, the small business grants, you'll notice that probably looks low. This is only the, the portion of the American Rescue Plan dollars that will put into the third round of the small business grants. So for those listening at home, our third round, which was um, launched last fall, was a total of $7 million. And that helped 760 small businesses. Uh, but this $3 million was the part from ARPA. Um, also, I wanted to make sure that you are aware that we are moving on the infrastructure programs now. We do have a consultant underway to help us identify gaps in, the broad, in our broadband, and they are right now conducting community engagement surveys as well as individual interviews with stakeholders, again, to help us identify gaps and then recommend solutions on how we can use our ARPA dollars. We are also working with MSD and the Whitewater Township Regional Sewer District to start moving on agreements related to the a sewer extension out in Whitewater Township. And of course, we have many other programs I'm happy to answer questions on, but a few other just to highlight. We've obviously been working on the 513 relief bus and getting the word out about that, as well as the new bus constructed. And we are deploying nonprofit grants out as we speak in the amount of a little over $6 million. So simultaneous to all of that, we've also brought together, as, as Administrator Aluto mentioned, um, stakeholder groups. So over the past handful of months, we, stakeholders were brought together to help inform program recommendations in six areas. And you can see those up here as, long, as well as with their budgeted amounts. So the process for this, this short stakeholder input was to gather their input over four meetings then we overlaid those discussions with the ARPA final rule, which came out um, in January. We also overlaid those recommendations with budgeted amounts, as well as funding principles that we've had since we first were notified that ARPA dollars would be coming to the county. Putting all those together, we have developed draft recommendations for the board consideration. So I just wanna quickly though go over the funding principles. We wanted to make sure that using ARPA dollars, we wanted to focus, of course, on continued urgent public health and economic needs. We also wanted to make sure, while we hit those um, still urgent needs, that our funding was, to the most extent possible, investments were going to be transformational and more long-term thinking. We also want to focus on, again, this economic stability and community resiliency that was already mentioned. And we wanted to avoid the creation of new programs that needed that would need ongoing support after ARPA dollars are extinguished. Now, if there are new programs um, recommended here, we did do our best to try and identify other funding sources that could continue that program after ARPA dollars. Um, and finally, we wanted to, of course, minimize any duplication with other ARPA funded programs, whether that's from other local governments, from the state, or other federal programs. So as I said, stakeholders met four times to provide their expertise and input. And a few themes came out from each, each of the stakeholder groups. Um, 
one, that of the six priorities, you can't really look at them in a silo. A lot of these mental health, when you talk about mental health, you can't really talk about that without talking maybe about housing. When you talk about workforce development, you can't really talk about that without talking about housing. When you're talking about public health, you also have to talk about mental health and housing. So all of these are all really connected together. And so we wanna make sure that um, our funding opportunities really are, are consider how our investments can impact multiple of our priority areas. We also heard from the stakeholders to, pro to really focus on the most underserved communities and also to focus on alleviating barriers. And we also, again, similar to the board principles, we heard about avoiding duplication, um, scaling up existing programs with proven outcomes, and to emphasize prevention and early intervention. So you will notice, though, throughout this presentation that in most cases, specific organizations are not named. Um, that this is intentional, as many of our programs will be deployed as grant programs, and or we do have to follow either state or federal procurement, whichever is most restrictive. So we had to keep that in mind as well. So you're not gonna see a lot of individual organizations named in this document. In addition, not every idea could be a standalone program. So we did try as much as possible is to consolidate ideas we heard into other program recommendations. So with that, I'll start with the public health recommendations. As you've already heard and you know, we have spent millions of CARES Act dollars on public health. We did that with, with testing, we stood up testing, and that wasn't just the individual test, it was the data along with the test, it was the staffing along with the testing, the advertising, the awareness. Uh, we also did a lot with uh, PPE, and we also did a lot with, of course, vaccinations. So with this $6 million we have set aside for public health, we're hoping, we're hoping to be able to address any ongoing issues and impacts and to help uh, with um, ongoing resiliency. So we are recommending, uh, first and foremost, $3 million for grant funding to uh, improve critical preparedness infrastructure. So again, these funds would be deployed through a grant process. Uh, we did have very specific investments that were raised by the stakeholders in those meetings, and those included specifically some IT and data infrastructure needs, related to um, pandemic and pandemic tracking and information technology, as well as negative air pressure rooms, ventilation, and other types of needs that may not have been brought up yet uh, during the stakeholder group. So we opted to go with a grant program for this type of, to, to provide this type of need uh, to the public health community. We have one and a half million dollars uh, was recommended for testing. So the board may recall you already authorized that in the 2022 budget resolution is to provide additional funding for testing as well as website and vaccine coordination. So that is already underway and actually the testing agreement is coming before the board on Thursday for consideration. Uh, but that was something that came out of the public health group as well. And lastly, um, when it comes to uh, nursing, we all have heard the stories about the impact the pandemic has had on nursing. So we are recommending uh, roughly $1.5 million to support nursing program expansion through local programs. So this will allow one-time funding to allow those nursing programs uh, to apply for funds to expand their programs. So it could be expand a lab, expand the curriculum, um, to really help get more nurses into the, the healthcare uh, workforce. Um, we also heard that there may be some barriers to enrollment of nursing programs, so th this funding could also potentially be used to help overcome those barriers, whether it's related to stipends, transportation, those types of barriers. Um, and of course, there was also discussion during this uh, group on the comorbidities, as well as the health disparities that COVID exposed. I just wanna um, you know, remind those folks listening the board has set aside $5 million for um, uh, outreach for, to disproportionately impacted populations, and that is going to be used for the 513 relief bus, as well as uh, appropriate medical services and outreach to help reduce health disparities. So that is a separate pot of funding um, in addition to this $6 million. Um, for mental health, we have $8 million, and our top recommendation is to expand the mobile crisis team 
Right now it is not 24-7. Uh, these funds would allow uh, the mobile crisis team to expand to 24-7. It would, of course, be throughout Hamilton County. Those funds would also be allowed uh, to be used for any outreach to make sure partners are aware of the expansion and to, if there are any technology needs um, to help improve communications, these funds could be um, used for that. So this program would most likely be run through the Hamilton County Mental Health Services and Recovery Board. We are also um, recommending a million dollars to help improve awareness on mental health issues, um, specifically targeted to parents, guardians, and teens. Um, we are also would like to see this campaign um, really address stigmas and misconceptions about mental health. And most importantly, we did hear feedback that we want to make sure this type of awareness has built-in outcomes and metrics. So if, if it is needed to continue after ARPA dollars are extinguished, there would be outcomes and metrics and measurements available for other funders to come in and help with that, with the continuation of that campaign. And lastly, while not specifically addressed in the stakeholder meetings, I think we're all aware of the um, impacts that social isolation has had, um, on, especially on teens, uh, due to the pandemic. So we are uh, recommending to expand proven youth programs that really target um, outdoor activities, after school programs, summer programs, to really help overcome the, the social isolation impacts that we've, we saw uh, with the pandemic. Um, and I think one takeaway from the mental and behavioral health group is the recognition that there has been an increased demand on and for mental health employees. Um, we know they, they've taken on an additional burden with the, the number of, of people that need additional assistance, especially from the pandemic. So there are challenges, like many uh, workforce developments, with recruitment and retention of mental health workers. So this just needs to, I think we all need to understand that this, this is a reality and it could be a challenge as we try and deploy some of these programs. So we just need to be aware of that and mindful of that. Um, for homelessness prevention, we learned through our group that one of the most effective ways to reduce homelessness is to obviously step in before someone loses their housing. Not only is it, is it more cost effective, but it is obviously way more, uh, less disruptive to the family or individual. So we are recommending $3 million uh, to expand the current shelter diversion program. The current program provides up to six months of um, wraparound services, case management, financial assistance to help keep people in their homes. And what we have found is that oftentimes that six months may not be enough time to help address all the needs for, um, for folks that are on the verge of homelessness. Now, this is another one of those programs that we really want to look at what's going to happen after ARPA funding ends. So uh, it is our understanding that shelter diversion programs are largely ineligible for federal funding under the continuum of care unless certain benchmarks are met. So if this recommendation is acted upon, we would want to make sure we have proper consideration um, to ensure that we have the appropriate tracking in place to make sure that once ARPA funds are extinguished, that we have met those benchmarks and the program could then potentially be funded through other federal sources. Um, in addition to that, uh, we are recommending two million for a homelessness uh, prevention grant. And what we are looking for here is to look for, to fund new innovative solutions to homelessness prevention with a, with a real focus on collaboration as well as long-term funding sustainability. So those are the $5 million for homelessness prevention. So our big pot of money is, of course, as you all know, affordable housing. And just to set the stage, since 2016, we, Hamilton County has invested $7.6 million in affordable housing. That's about 725 units. Um, the, so the county's existing efforts through our HUD funding combined with the, the board's uh, focus on community revitalization that we're doing through the general fund dollars. I think this additional money we're providing will really enhance and advance uh, more quickly um, the board's priorities to have 
to retain residents, to keep residents in the county, and to preserve housing. So the $20 million is allocated for new affordable housing projects. We are recommending that in two pots. 17 and a half million would be administered by a qualified third party to provide grants to, um, to, to do new production of affordable housing. Now the stakeholders did mention they would like to of course see the area, you know, if you're gonna build new housing, let's look at try and, try and have it near community anchors, whether that's childcare facilities, schools, places of employment. Um, again, really focus on the more underserved communities, focus on redevelopment of areas. Um, so that would be that first pot of 17 and a half million. We, really, we want to work with a qualified third party so they can really, they would have more expertise and capacity. And we wanna make sure they would be more aware of all the other funding sources that are available. So this would really minimize duplication and it would maximize leveraging our dollars to get as many units as possible through our funding. Now, a subset of that 20 million, we're recommending to be a more um, tangible project led by the county. And that would be one where we're really looking at intentionally constructing affordable housing to have as minimal operating and maintenance costs as possible. And when we're thinking about this, we're looking at very low energy costs, very low water usage, so the, the residents that live in those houses can keep more money in their pocket on a monthly basis. That's really helps, we think, to improve economic mobility. So this is, this is a little different, um, but this is something we're excited to explore with the board. So that's the 20 million for new housing. We have 10 million for housing preservation. We would recommend 8 million of that to support the renovation of existing multifamily or single family affordable housing. Again, similarly, we would have a qualified third party to help deploy those funds to ensure we're leveraging our dollars as much as possible. We're providing gap financing in order to have as many units um, constructed and renovated as, as we can with these dollars. And lastly, we're recommending $2 million for a home repair program. Um, this will, uh, of course, as you all know, allow residents to stay in their homes, and it will also allow us to have invest in, in some of the county's aging housing stock. So what we are looking for with this is, is a grant, grant to occupied homeowner, owner-occupied homes. It could be used for things such as plumbing, roofing, foundational repairs, and we really want to focus, and this is an ARPA final rule actually, is energy efficiency. Again, to try and uh, reduce the operating costs for people that live in these homes. So workforce development, I could literally stand up here for an hour and talk about workforce development because it was really good conversations we had with the stakeholder groups. Um, this group really focused on how can we improve economic success for both employees, prospective employees, employers, as well as the workforce training programs that we have here. We really wanted to be able to, to connect employees with careers that have upward mobility and that will encourage financial stability, at the same time, help employers find, recruit, and retain good talent. So there was much discussion, you can imagine, about childcare in this group, because that was, that's it. Um, a big concern, a big need, as we know. And the group also talked a lot about what are the key industries that are in demand right now that our employers need people. Um, so the key industries identified were, of course, childcare, healthcare, which includes mental health, construction and skilled trades, manufacturing, transportation, IT, and hospitality. Additionally, there was a lot of discussion that there are many resources in Hamilton County for workforce development, but coordination and connectivity needs to be improved. And that's where we have this quote, and I wish I could remember who said it in the stakeholder group. Hamilton County is resource rich when it comes to workforce development, but coordination poor. And that's one gap you'll see we're recommending to try and fill with ARPA dollars. And finally, I, there was a, a very deep recognition amongst the stakeholders about the benefits cliff and how that is such a barrier to economic mobility. So for those listening, it, this, this occurs when career advancement puts a family 
above income eligibility for public assistance programs. Mm -hmm. And so due to the loss of those programs, their career advancement can result in the family being financially worse off than before the wage increase. So I know this is not new to a lot of us. I know a lot of members of our community are talking about it. I bring it before you today because it's not a formal recommendation to use our ARPA funds for this, but um, there, there appeared to be a lot of buy-in from the stakeholders that they'd be willing to participate actively with Hamilton County if we wanted to have a stronger role in advocating for ways to minimize the benefits cliff. So that's a more structural issue. I just wanted you to be aware of that did that was a piece um, that came out pretty strong through these discussions. So with that background, um, the recommendations for workforce development include first and foremost, a significant amount of funding, seven and a half million, to support workforce development and training programs that are focused on those in-demand careers. Um, we are looking at training programs, and we want those training programs to reduce barriers to participation. So is it a barrier to participate in a, uh, a, a CDL training program? Is a barrier getting the, the, the uh, students to the, to the place of, of training? Okay, can we provide transportation? Um, is there a barrier to taking a training program because you aren't being paid to take that training program, but you're but you can't work while taking that training program. So can you provide a stipend? So we want to really focus these dollars on overcoming um, the barriers to employment and to participation. I think the board has heard from many workforce training partners, whether it comes from IT, from CDL and transportation training, these would be deployed as grant funds for these training programs to apply for. And they would have to meet again certain criteria such as how are you overcoming barriers? Are you focusing on our target populations which, which the stakeholders has identified as underemployed, unemployed, residents that are in shelter diversion program, as well as our returning citizens. So that's, that's where that pot of money would come from. We really tried to focus, you know, when, in, in trying to minimize duplication with other ARPA programs, uh, we really tried to find where is the best place for us to plug in. And we felt this was one of the top areas is to really support existing programs or new pilot programs to address these in-demand careers. Um, child care, again, would fall under this um, recommendation. And I do want to note we became aware that the state of Ohio, as you can see here, when it comes to child care, has, has allocated $800 million in ARPA dollars for child care grants. And that includes um, workforce retention and hiring bonuses as well as um, operational costs. So we tried very hard to, to not duplicate here. Um, the second um, recommendation is, again, target, this is targeted to more towards teens, youth, young adults, as well as parents and guardians, is to really market what are these in-demand careers. And again, I've already mentioned them and they are listed here. We really want to make sure Many of these don't require a four-year degree. Many of these have misconceptions about salary, conditions, and how you could move up in the organization. And we think we could do a great campaign working with the, with the industries as well as pro professional marketing um, folks to really dispel some of these myths around these in-demand career jobs and to help change the narrative about how these jobs can really help increase economic mobility. And lastly, I mentioned this idea we are resource rich but coordination poor. Um, the, the group really wanted to see more connectivity amongst employees, employers, workforce development programs, and this idea of bringing more of a, a coordinating partner, a, a quarterback, if you will, to lead those efforts for our region. We have a, a group that that's, has, has started to do that. That's the Workforce Innovation Center. Um, they are doing some great work with all of the workforce development partners. Um, so they were specifically mentioned in the stakeholder group as a potential to fill this, this void. And then last but not least, and you've probably heard youth throughout many of these, of these recommendations, um, but, but specific to youth employment, the stakeholders did, did stress 
again, like other programs, leverage successful programs to allow them to expand and reach more youth. And so we do have, there was a lot of, of great compliments about JFS's work in this area. And so we are recommending just under $4 million to expand both the Office of Youth as well as the Comprehensive Case Management Employment Program. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> so we will be working with JFS on if, if the board um, so chooses to move on this recommendation, we'll be working with them on specifics to expand that program to reach more youth. And then lastly, we did hear, um, again, a lot of workforce programs available, a lot of programs available for youth. Uh, maybe not, it's, it's hard to find them. So there was a recommendation to create a, a digital navigator, if you will, to help specifically youth have one place to show where they can ha get help with either jobs, uh, career advice, mentoring, leadership opportunities. And finally, in order to reduce one barrier to employment, there is a recommendation to, to consider a pilot transportation program. That can be a barrier for teens and youth to get jobs. And so we would look at um, developing a program to help overcome that specific barrier uh, with these funds. With the idea of, again, any pilot would have to have um, long term, how would you continue this long term? And we would be sure to incorporate that in, into any program. Is anyone tired yet? <laughs> um, so um, I, will, I will be a little quiet here now, but these are the proposed next steps. It's a lot of information. It's a lot of really great work. We've had so many good people working on this. Um, so we are seeking board fee feedback on these recommendations. Um, anything you have additional questions on that we can get back to you on. Uh, we'd like to finalize the plan and then eventually get board authorization to start implementing, which we have, I'm sure you've heard, we have a lot of folks anxious uh, for us to get these dollars out and we're excited to, to move on them. So, sorry for the length, but it's a lot of information. I'm happy That's to answer great. any questions. Thank you so much, Holly, great information. It's, it's something that we have been uh, looking forward to as it relates to new programs and continuing the ones that we have uh, had. It's so much information. Um, I think the plan is just really great. Um, I just had a couple general questions. I'm sure we can specifically send you some information, but I didn't see any timelines. Um, so timetables on when we plan on launching specific programs because our priorities may be different and we certainly have to be in agreement uh, with you know where do we start first and, and things like that um, and also what partners are we planning on using to implement some of these programs I know all our, our can, county staff can't do it all and it sounds like the county may be taking a deeper dive in real estate from what I'm hearing you uh, which is a, a whole different aspect of of where we are um, and the other thing, I don't know, I, I think we've been applauded before by the state for our CARES dollars and how we spent those, and we're doing great with American Rescue Plan. We're not letting the stuff, the money sit on the table. We're getting the money out. You can see already and, and previously how well we've done. We not only want the people that we're giving the money to to, to strive, but to thrive, because this money won't be here uh, all always and we're looking at not only at short-term goals for the ones we're giving the money to but also long-term goals your, your staff and Jeff's staff and all of you need to be applauded of course continually for your work um, I just wonder we hear youth 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 and a lot of this uh, information and I we may be falling a little short on youth um, um, for me um, I'm just wondering, where, since we might be getting into the real estate business, how about that the county have their own work, I hear what JFS is doing, which is great, but you have to be under the auspices of JFS, some, have some sort of involvement, but just a normal young man or young woman uh, out there and that the county is having a summer work program and that will increase their um, mental health, their emotional health, social isolation, all those kinds of things. Not really for a career path necessarily, but just to have some money in your pocket where, you know, I keep bringing up, you know, our violence is off the hook um, and pay enough where they can just have some their own money and go to wherever the Kings Island or the show or whatever. But uh, really it's a bigger impact because we're looking at 
uh, you know, futuristically that people care, they, their self-confidence, all those kinds of things. Um, and just to have some money in your pocket and mentors that can help them. I know we don't know a lot about the ones that are out there, you know, having young nephews, I know a little bit about it, but just at the county start, and this, I don't know, I didn't talk to you about it, just as you were talking more about youth, I'm thinking, why can't the county, we always talk about the city had CCY and all of that, why can't the county have a work program, a summer work program, and for all these special reasons, not like, as I said, and I'll end it, not just um, to earn money, but we know um, children have been isolated through their education and everything else, but to make them feel better, make them feel like they don't have to do certain things that will end up having them in trouble and uh, hire some people to run it and and not have to be involved in JFS. Uh, but just kids that want to be positive, uh, I just want to throw that out just for consideration and I'll write you, a, you know, something. I'll write Jeff something about it. But wouldn't it be great if the county had their own, I'm, now I'm advocating and soliciting and everything else, but wouldn't it be great? I mean, I know it would take some work, but I mean, we have some um, blueprints of how it's done. It's not, you know, real hard. And as long as we can justify it through our funding, I think we need to do that. And I thank uh, Director Patton for what you're doing at JFS and, and you're um, going to expand what you're doing, but some are not in that situation um, that they would even qualify. So I think that's about all I have on uh, the timetable, the partners, and um, just, I don't know if you guys have priority. I guess the timetable will indicate what your priorities are as far as implementation, but I'd like to see that also. Sure. Okay. We do have our rough estimated quarters okay. when things would start, so I can okay. share that with you. Yeah, and I think it's great that you guys are using some forward thinking that you know that the money is not gonna be here forever. And so how do we not only um, maintain, but sustain people? So, okay, Vice President Reese, thank you. Uh, let me say, I wanna start off by, uh, I know Administrator uh, Aludo started this uh, section off and he ran off uh, very quickly a lot of things that uh, the staff here under uh, the administration has put forward under the board's direction. And I want to just go a step further for people that are watching. Um, I was uh, in New York at a national uh, convention. And let me just say that Hamilton County is um, out front in terms of we've been able to get the dollars and diversify and uh, help keep the small businesses open, everything from small business to senior citizens to youth. Um, and I just wanted to highlight, I know we had a, uh, a slide just on ARPA that's just starting. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to get a slide up uh, maybe next time that shows kind of everything. So when people are watching, they can see that thousands of people were helped. And certainly we still have more to do. But Hamilton County, uh, through our board direction, we are out front. A lot of counties had to give the money back, couldn't get the money out didn't have any ideas, didn't have the infrastructure, couldn't move quickly, uh, and that's unfortunate. Uh, but we have kind of become a model so far, and we're still improving, and I just want to commend uh, our administration and you guys for uh, implementing these things at a, at a, at a uh, quick pace. Of course, you know, I'm always pushing quicker because uh, we're in a 911 situation. But I do want to say that that is to be committed. Now, where we're going now is where do we go with these dollars and how do we invest? I look at this as an investment in the people. And uh, it's the first time in history, United States, that I can recall that uh, there's been an investment in the people. We usually bail out an industry uh, and hope that it trickles down. So we want to make sure that as we're making this decision, we don't go back to we're bailing out and we're putting an organization and hoping it trickles down. Uh, we are the rubber that meets the road. Uh, Washington can release the money, uh, but it's just like Amazon. You can order something, and if the truck never shows up, you never got the package. We're the truck that shows up to get the package, get the help to, to the citizens. Um, I compared the document that you're proposing 
um, and it, thank you for the thoroughness. Um, Compare that document with uh, our budget. Uh, each of us had to send in budget recommendations. Many of our recommendations got in the budget to the budget that we passed with the, uh, the ARPA, the buckets that we have. And today I know we're talking about where do we put the buckets. I wanna, um, I'll start with uh, President Dumas, what she had indicated, I wanna follow up. I'll start there because I think she raised a very important issue uh, that's important, I know, to me and all of the board. Uh, but I know that in my uh, document that I sent to the administrator, all of us had to send a document. The youth component was that uh, we wanted to have a youth employment development component. In that component, there were several components in it, which is that we wanted to have a youth office. We didn't say the youth office had to be over at Jobs and Family Services. We said we wanted an office of youth uh, going back to uh, what uh, President Dumas is saying, have something that's orchestrated for youth. I think it's important that as we're moving forward with these so-called new one-time dollars, that we are also looking at some new ways and new ideas. We don't want this to be a cushion for what we've already done, and I know that's not your intention, uh, as you've indicated in the, um, in the presentation that we looked at. But uh, when we talk about the CCY, it had its own component, and I know the city is moving, trying to move forward with its own independent, their only job is youth. And I wanna make sure on these programs, uh, because there are dollars that we don't have the income barrier. Uh, that's what makes this, these dollars, and I know they have rules and so forth, but they've kind of loosened where a so-called working class, middle class, or whatever you call them, the people who are one paycheck away from losing a house, but there's no program. Uh, until we had a program, said prior to the people who have children that have gone to college and come back and they need it, they, they want to have an internship, paid internship, but don't want to be turned away because their parents are not destitute. Mm -hmm. um, people who want to come in with a fellowship program, but they say your parents making a little too much uh, because uh, they're able to, you know, be one paycheck away from not losing everything. So we want to use these dollars not to be a JFS program. This is to be kind of a different piece, as uh, President Dumas has indicated. And the youth is very important. We got a summer coming, and everybody's going to say, what in the world has happened this summer? Youth ain't got nothing to do. They running. And if they have nothing to do, uh, or let me just rephrase it. I, I told the governor once, and I'll say this. This is my philosophy. We must get our youth program jobs program, internship program, entrepreneurship program for youth. We got to get our program to the youth before the streets get to the youth. There will be a program. It's either our program or the streets. And so I think that I um, concur uh, with what President Dumas has indicated in this that was presented. We put in the budget to have a youth development office. We didn't say where it would have to be that would be Hamilton County based, focus on it. We also said we wanted to have a paid fellowship and internship program, paid. Summer's almost here. We got to get them in here. Don't come back with the program in the winter, not you, but I'm just saying that's, you know, what we're, we've got to be on a fast track. And then we want an annual report on everything happening for youth. We can't get our arms around it. Have we less, you know, we want to have something. More youth this summer did better than last summer. More youth have, been employed than last. We don't have no roadmap to kind of measure what we're doing and do we need to tweak something or maybe what we're doing is great, we need to put more into it. That's what um, we wanted to see. So I, I like on the youth piece, I thought in this particular presentation, um, I think we got some more work to define to, to that and to get that moving very, very quickly because uh, we did put it in the, in the budget as a priority. The other thing I wanted to say in here, workforce. Now, I really want to hone in on it and have a better understanding. Uh, a couple years ago, we needed, uh, we had not enough jobs and we needed the people. Now we got a whole bunch of jobs and less people who want to be on the jobs. So. The one piece I would say is that um, 
I don't know if training is the answer. Uh, I do think the incentive portion that you mentioned is a component that would be good. Like you said, nobody's going to train and they can't get paid right. now because the bills are due. So I think that's a very important part, um, and I, I thank you for that. I think that should be included. However, I'm not sure. We did put $15 million, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, but I would like to see a better understanding. Is $15 million really needed, or are we just trying to spend $15 million because we put it there? Do we need to take, I don't know, I'm just throwing this out there, and I'm not saying that this is my answer for the day, but this is what I want to have a little more research. We've got a bunch of jobs, and we got less people for the jobs. So, and I don't think it's training is their problem. Uh, I like the nursing component, uh, but we also have the Southwest Ohio. I don't know how much money they got. I'm, I'm on the board, I gotta find out, but how much money they got. So I don't wanna be just, if we don't need 15 million and the, we got the uh, Southwest getting money from the state and all of that, and we got more money and more jobs and not enough people, then I'd like to see maybe some of those dollars need to be switched. Not all of them, but something might be switched if the housing is a bigger need. I think on housing, uh, we, 40 million sounds like a lot, but the need is a lot greater. And the investment in the ROI might be greater. We might be able to leverage some of those other dollars we already have to deal with workforce and move some of these dollars over maybe to create workforce housing so that somebody can afford uh, to live. I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not saying it's the, the last piece, but that's something that I would like to have looked at and maybe provide us with uh, information on that. The other thing on mental health, we have a mental health levy and certainly we don't have enough for mental health, but I wanna see how that overlays. Mm -hmm the mental health levy, and then what we're investing. Because when we looked at mental health and the actual, I know we had the PowerPoint, but the actual document has a lot in there dealing with fentanyl and drug overdose. And certainly that's important. But I don't know, there also, I know some people who normally maybe didn't need help, but now they got all this pressure uh, bills are piling up. I don't have the big job I used to have, and now I've got to find two jobs to try to put it together. Um, and I just want to make sure that we're not, we already have, we do have money for the uh, opioid, and we, of course we never could have enough, but we have some money for opioid. I don't want it to say mental health, and then underneath is basically all opioid. Um, we do have people who are unfortunately committing suicide at a higher rate and uh, teenagers, mm -hmm. uh, the African-American community, which we don't talk about it. Right. Um, and some of them are drinking themselves to death. Not, they might not be fentanyl, it might have been alcohol. Um, so I just wanna make sure that we do that. How do we leverage what we have? <coughs> if it needs increasing, fine, but maybe there needs to be some diversification in the mental health component and how does all of them kind of line up and help each other. Yeah, we can follow up with you on that for sure. Yeah, because this document was yeah. said a little different. Um, the other thing is uh, you said we have a hard time getting mental health workers and they need help, you know, after hearing everybody's problems right. all day. Uh, it's traumatic and they are heroes. Uh, maybe having some kind of incentives for staffing. Uh, maybe there's some incentive, pay incentive, uh, they get also, uh, they gonna need somebody to talk to their sales. But I'd like to see some kind of pay incentive that might get them to, uh, like we did with nursing, people could be a traveling nurse and some people did it during COVID because mm -hmm. it was a pay incentive. So maybe looking at that and if there's some shuffling around we have to do financially, but I just think that should be on the table since that's a hard, uh, you know, a person to recruit you as you was indicating um, housing production like I said I'm interested in putting a little more in that area if necessary um, because I'm not sure um, here on this implement a grant program to produce new affordable housing um, just one more information sure. uh, my position on housing is I don't want to have a as, the circle the people who created 
of the affordable housing problem now, or some of them are running back now, say they got the answer to the problem they created. <laughs> so I wanna make sure we got new people to it. Uh, we have produced a lot, but it's scattered. I wanna make sure it's kind of like uh, President Dumas, which you just kind of mentioned. We want some things that got the Hamilton County stamp on it. Uh, not something that we gave you 15,000 toward your project and then you know we show up and we just wave your hand and then they say we didn't do anything. We need something we can touch a project that's led by Hamilton County that pulled everything, pulled the broadband in, uh, something that's energy efficient, uh, help with the down payment that we can bring in. I was with the Secretary of HUD uh, two weeks ago that we could try to bring her in and look what we did for affordable housing. Now that's not the only thing, that's just one. Mm -hmm. And then we can have some of these others, but we have done a lot, but you still, we still feel like we didn't hit the nail because you know, we, we cut some ribbons and everything, but it's kind of like, well, us and everybody else. We're trying to have something that can be a model uh, that could be replicated that we could say as a board, we stood up on affordable housing. Here's a project we did, plus we invested in these other projects. So if there needs to be some shifting mm -hmm. of some funding, you know, let us know. But I think that uh, for me, I know, I don't want to speak for uh, my colleagues, but for me, that's what I'm looking for, that we could touch and feel it could be a, uh, might have some solar on it that can show that, look at this model that can be replicated. Uh, is what I'm looking for. And then my last thing is senior citizens. We uh, did a um, we did a senior program that we ha uh, just passed last week. Uh, and something again, uh, when we uh, put what we wanted uh, in there, I really was pushing seniors because senior citizens, they couldn't get this other money. They didn't qualify because they got a Social Security check. But the Social Security check never went up but the Duke Energy did go up, the water did go up. And so they were left out there with nowhere to go. And uh, this board are very excited and I wanna thank my colleagues because it's something I really was pushing. We came up now with a $1.25 million fund that's being rolled out, have its own number. We want that to be sustained because seniors obviously uh, still, we wanna make it affordable for them to be able to continue to live here so that's a, a component i don't see uh investment maybe it's from something else but we want to at least have a mention into it so that they know that seniors we are investing in you as well on an ongoing basis i know this one was just for the next i don't know six months or whatever to the end of the year but we want something ongoing for senior citizens uh, and i think it should be a part of something here so that's all i have uh, looking forward to working with you. This is a great, great start. Uh, this has been very, very helpful. Um, and I think overlaying it with our regular budget and levy dollars and ARPA money, we can get kind of a clearer picture about, you know, how do we invest and how do we get an ROI from the investment. So thank you for your work, Holly. It's, I know it's very tough to bring all these partners and try to figure it out and then narrow it down to a PowerPoint. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, and we look. I look forward to appreciate your with feedback. You. Yep. Thank you, and I think you brought up a, a, a lot of great points. But um, the last point you made about branding, and the fact that Hamilton County is doing a lot of great things here, and as you were saying, we're having CAA do this part, and Talbert House do this part, and I like what you were saying, United Way do this part, and then we go out and cut the ribbon. Uh, but a lot of people, and I think it's good, we need to toot our own, own horn for Hamilton County, not for us, but the fact that they don't know what the board is doing. We're giving out money and we're, you know, for the things that are priority and our, our vision, but I think our branding needs to show that Hamilton County, we're, we're listening to you. We hear you. And these are the things that we're doing. And these are the people that we are using to implement, implement our vision and our goals. And I think we lack on that. And I think we need to do a, a better job of that. So, uh, Madam President, if uh -huh. I may, I think that's I think your, your point to that is when under cares, we recognize we missed that uh -huh. because we just didn't have time mm -hmm. and we learned from that. Right. And I know that we're, we're trying working with Bridget to, to improve upon that with sure. with our ARPA dollars to really share the good news and celebrate the successes. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Commissioner Driehaus. Thank you. Uh -huh. 
Um, thank you, Holly, for the presentation. Um, I also want to publicly thank all the stakeholders that um, participated in the four meetings and uh, Ernst and Young who coordinated this whole effort for us. Um, I know a lot of time and energy was spent putting all this together. Um, I, I just at a high level, um, I want to say that the um, attention to equity, adaptability, and sustainability, I think, are right on. I think that makes a lot of sense as we move through the recommendations and kind of what our targeted priorities are. Um, so I'm just going to um, click through, as others did, um, related to some of the recommendations. Um, it strikes me under the um, health care workforce expansion to nursing programs, it strikes me that there might be other populations that might be also included as opposed to just nursing. I think of the health care workers that are going into people's homes, trying to keep seniors in their houses, uh, those kinds of folks that are on the front lines doing really a health care component, but they're not necessarily training for nursing school. Mm -hmm. And so I just throw that out there as maybe a way to expand our thinking related to that workforce that's really so hard to get right now. Um, I have a question related to the mental health and behavioral recommendations. The um, mobile crisis team, I, I read the report and I, I could see some of the um, outline there. Can you help me better understand the uh, partners beyond mental health and recovery services that are involved with that. And when we say expansion, is it, I, I noted that it was expansion of the hours. Mm -hmm. It would become more of a 24-7 operation. Um, does, is it an expanded service all the, also then to different populations or, or what does that look like? Yeah, it is, it is, the cost is the expansion to 24-7. I believe they would hire roughly 10 new employees to help with that expansion. And it would continue to be throughout Hamilton County. So it is for that incremental cost to go from, I think there, is Lisa Webb in here? She is. I'm going to ask her for backup here. I believe their current hours are Monday through Friday, 8.30 to midnight, and Saturday and Sunday from 11.30 to 7.30. Mm -hmm. So this would allow that expansion to 24-7. And the partners here are Mental Health Recovery Board as well as UC Health. Okay. Okay. Getting nods from Lisa. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the other thing related to mental health, um, I hear a lot about kids in this space. Uh, kids are really struggling. We've all kind of hit on this. Um, I wonder if beyond the um, youth resiliency, and, and I noted, and I have a recreation background, mm -hmm. um, so I did note a lot of the recreation pieces that were part of this youth programming piece. Um, I would love to have, by the way, a county recreation department. I, I know it's, I, listen, I know, uh, but man, oh man, we've got, no, I know, I know. I've not talked to the administrator about it, but oh my Lord, wouldn't that be great? Be, and, I, and I've done a little research and there aren't any. I, so every, every, there aren't any. Be the first. But we could be the trendsetters yeah. on this. But anyway, but that's what we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, a recreation component um, for kids to, you know, give them not only something to do, but to acquire skills and relationships and all that kind of stuff. So um, beyond that, though, when I think about this two million, and I, I wonder if this is enough, I'm going to suggest that maybe it's not enough. Uh, we also have kids experiencing serious trauma uh, in this community, and I wonder beyond just the the recreation piece, which I think is critically important, we also identify maybe a more serious piece to this that relates to children's trauma and how we push some of our dollars down to recognize that and to work on that. Um, the uh, homelessness prevention piece, um, I, I, I'm, I don't know if anybody spoke to this, but we have done a lot in this space through CARES. We were the first ones out of the gate to rehouse the homeless population and then retrofit the facilities so they could go back to the um, shelters. Um, I, I, I recognize and appreciate that diversion is less expensive and probably better for everyone, including um, the individuals that we're talking about. Um, so I, I understand the emphasis through that. Uh, the five million, um, th these two I, buckets seem so similar, the three million and the two million. Um, it, I wonder if we could kind of push some of that together um, and then um, talk about, I don't, I don't know how much of it, maybe, maybe none, I don't know. But I too want to put more towards the housing component. I mean, I think we've all, um, made this one of our top priorities, and 40 million has not gone as far <laughs> as I think um, I was hoping. But um, you know, I, I totally agree that the 17.5 needs to be leveraged with the city, with the state, with other private uh, organizations that are in this space. We need to leverage these dollars so that they expand because our 40 million, as as we've all said, um, is, is just 
it's not enough to really robustly address this, so we count on others to leverage their dollars. Um, so I, I totally get that and in, in favor of that. Um, and then the sustainability of the affordable housing will become important. I also read in the report that um, new housing is great, preservation is also great. And having come from a community council a long time ago, we were always looking to not build new so much as preserve what we had and retrofit it. And so I, I appreciate the recognition of that here and a pretty um, significant investment uh, in that space as well. I think that's really smart and I think that's what the communities really need uh, because we all have those homes in our neighborhoods that could really um, use people living in them and um, some, some work on them. Uh, and, and then I, and I also want to mention that um, the home repair program, we're doing some of that through CDBG, but this is great, a great injection mm -hmm. into that, but the sustainability hopefully will come through CDBG. Correct. Um, and then the workforce, um, my only comment here, I mean, it's obviously important. I, I appreciate the notation about the in-demand jobs in the industries that are looking for folks. I really want to see more emphasis on childcare um, because we, we know that people aren't going back to work because they don't have childcare. And so it's not only the industry of childcare that's struggling to keep people working at their uh, places of employment, but it's also the reduction of opportunities for child care in our community. I, I remember seeing this number, I can't remember, I don't know if it was in this report or something else I was reading, but we have lost a lot of child care opportunities for folks in this community. I am not sure how to get to that necessarily, other than I want to throw it out there um, as something that we, we might want to uh, put some focus on. Um, and then uh, the youth employment, I'm back to recreation again on that one. Uh, and, but, but we've all, you know, and my colleagues have talked a lot about this, about um, you know, bringing youth into our building even and providing opportunities here. And so I, I, I support that. I think it's a great idea. Um, so that's all I've got. I too wonder about process. Um, it, it sounds like we have had a lot of comment uh, and we're not quite there yet. Uh -huh. And so I don't know what the process looks like if we can have, you know, uh, I, I've suggested maybe a public hearing. I, I wonder if, um, if, if there's not an appetite for that. Maybe it's a public comment during one of our staff meetings where we continue to talk through these recommendations and allow, because usually on Tuesdays we don't not allow for public comment. Maybe we uh, flex a little bit on one of our Tuesday meetings and allow folks that would like to comment to this uh, the opportunity to do that. Um, I just throw that out there because I feel like this is a process and we're not quite where we need to be to make any kind of recommendations yet. Th and thank you. Thank you for your work. Thanks to the whole team for your work. Thank you. And public comments is certainly in order. We'll figure out how we're going to do it. Um, we can, you know, Thursdays we usually have comments. Uh, I don't know how quickly you guys want this back, our recommendations, but we have several questions, comments. I'm sure we'll put them in writing. But um, as you were saying, we had lots of stakeholders meetings. But as we uh, lay this out, there may be other questions from public, the public, and we'll make sure that they are able to give comments if they so want. I'm not going to go around again because if I start, then Alicia's going to start. <laughs> but I did want to say one thing. Um, I'm looking back here at youth employment, and, and Denise will start too. So um, the youth employment recommendations, I, I noticed the 750,000 K between youth and career pathways, a pilot transportation program, which you talked about. I know we can take uh, some of that money for our county uh, youth uh, work program. I, I think it would be we would be in, in agreement that uh, if we could wherever we want to take it from, but the money is there to take it. And in addition, what Commissioner Driehaus had mentioned about the nursing program to add on uh, those that are going to the home, but also there are a lot of medical social workers that are in the health care area, and we can include them in that process too. But I think we have kind of beat it uh, to death with some positive comments and, and um, some Madam direction. President, if, if, uh, if I could no. just briefly, um, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, just to, to kind of wrap this up, if, uh, as you indicated, if the if board members, similar to how we do the budget process, but on an expedited basis, if the board, and I took notes, I know others took notes in terms of what the commissioner comments were, but if there are things of high priority that we could get in writing from each office, we can then look to synthesize that into this document as quickly as possible, try to reach consensus so that we can get to the execu execution and implementation phase as quickly as possible. So, um, 
that's in terms of next steps. Sure. So we'll ne uh, make sure we announce and let uh, the public know that we'll be talking about this again. But if we could get our comments in no later than um, Monday, because I'm thinking Thursday we want public to come and we may have to change sort of some of what we're uh, thinking um, due to public comment. I'm not sure. I mean, you can get it in sooner if you'd like. Um, but if you can have it in by Monday, that would great be great uh, to administration. Uh, what are you getting ready to say? Quick. I just want to say, can, can we do Tuesday? Monday's my birthday, so I'm definitely going to take a day off. <laughs> Everybody's making me take a day off. But uh -huh. um, I do. I would definitely get it in writing and because uh -huh. I, I may have some questions before I put it in writing, sure. so I'm going to make sure I'm you know, on the right track. And I just want to um, end a lot of people watching. They're saying, oh, you got all this money. You're giving it over here and you're giving it over there. I think it's important to note that these dollars go back into the local economy. This kept the economy going. Uh, when people get this money, they got to go get groceries. They got to go get pay uh, bills to help jobs get going. So this comes back into the local uh, mm -hmm. local economy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just wanted to highlight that. Someone that said to me, oh, you guys just got money and just – Throwing money as a no, 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 no. We're investing mm -hmm. in Hamilton County, mm -hmm. and that money is invested in the local economy. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. And, and it's clearly defined in our rules where we can spend the money and where we can't. So, yeah. okay. All thank right. you. Oh, I thought you had something. Okay. Thank you so thank much. You. All right. Appreciate it. Okay. Our last item on the agenda is update on federal appropriation request. Jeff Aludo. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Commissioners, I uh, just wanted to provide the board with a brief update in terms of where we are on um, requesting uh, federal appropriations uh, or what's known as congressionally directed spending. Um, Bridget, I don't have the clicker, so are you going to run the? All right. Um, so uh, first of all, just in terms of some background, um, for those who might be watching at home, the commissioners are well aware of this. Uh, federally, uh, federal appropriations requests are, again, as I said, congressionally directed spending, or as they are otherwise known, earmark, congressional earmarks, um, are really when uh, a, a spending uh, component that authorizes discretionary funding to important local projects that support local priorities. So um, in this particular round, the submitting entity must be a state government, a local government, or a nonprofit, and this is a bipartisan uh, effort as well. This is um, both House and Senate members um, are taking requests for uh, congressionally directed spending. Bridget? Thank you. Um, also, just in terms of background, as the board is aware, uh, congressionally directed spending was eliminated back in, in 2011. So this hasn't been around for a while. So it returned uh, back in 2021 for fiscal year 2022, and it's now continued um, into fiscal year 23. Again, this is a bipartisan thing, uh, both houses of Congress uh, participating in this. As the board is aware, and just for the public's consumption, uh, last year we participated in this effort as well, and we received uh, $1.6 million uh, for the upgrade of the county's uh, public safety radio system, which will occur as we build out our new uh, EMA 911 facility. Um, this is also not just a, uh, for those who hear earmarks, they think that that this is something where funding for any, you know, can be for anything. It's really not. The, the funding has to be associated with specific accounts uh, or programs that are already in existence. So if you submit something that does not align with a current federal program, um, it's likely it going to be very difficult to fund. So um, in terms of the accounts, there's things related to agriculture, commerce and justice, energy and water development, the interior, environment related agencies, labor, HHS and education, uh, military and veterans, homeland security, uh, and transportation, HUD, and related entities. So this year, uh, the county submitted and is in the process of, of submitting uh, two uh, congressionally directed spending priorities. Uh, the number one priority is the regional safety complex, otherwise known as the relocation of the, of the uh, CPD gun range, which is currently in Evendale, uh, as well as uh, security improvements at the Hamilton County Justice Center. So I'm just going to walk through those briefly. Uh, the first uh, project, the first priority is the regional safety complex. Again, this is the relocation of the CPD gun range from its current home in Evendale uh, to co-locate that facility with the sheriff's 
um, firing range uh, in Coleraine Township as a regional safety complex um, to serve the needs not only of the city and the county, but also uh, our local municipal and township partners and various federal agencies who also um, are, are able to use the facility. Uh, the current facility abuts Lincoln Heights, uh, which as the board is aware is a high poverty area. It's also uh, within about a half a mile of 2,300 uh, residences. This has been a high priority for the board for going on, I don't know how long now, two years uh, to move the facility. The sound of gunfire is, is uh, in, in this community 300 days per year, approximate to uh, various residential areas and commercial areas. Um, and because of that, uh, and the impact on this vulnerable population, uh, the board has made it a, a high priority uh, to, to move. Bridget, if you could uh, hit the slide. So this shows you, uh, for those who can see at home, you know, just how centrally located to a uh, residential and commercial area uh, the current range at, on Spartan Drive uh, is. Uh, and, and again, um, there are some other reasons for doing this. There's the economic development potential associated with the site once it's moved, um, but, and, and Evendale is assisting greatly with that. That's a part of the Project Arrowhub, Arrowhub Corridor, uh, but just the impact on this population um, in Lincoln Heights and in Woodlawn uh, is extremely important. And our friends over um, at the Inquirer had done a, a, a nice story a year or so ago. Uh, I don't know if you can. Yeah, it went a little bit early, but uh, this is uh, thanks to Meg Vogel, who's the visual journalist over at the Inquirer. This was a story they had done about what it was like to live by the gun rate. So now, Bridget, if you could hit that. Thanks, thanks, Bridget. Uh, so obviously we know of the critical importance of making sure our public safety officers are well trained. The question is just is there a better, can we find a, a, a more efficient uh, place to do it that's better for the, for the community? Um, a lot of partners working on this, including um, uh, representatives from the city of Cincinnati who have been helping us um, uh, take a deep dive on this and, and, and look um, uh, at getting this, getting this done. Just a couple of quick renderings uh, that the board has already seen, but this would be a high level um, uh, overview of the, of the of a new public safety complex, including a skid pad, canine training range, um, as well as um, uh, multiple lanes and sniper training ranges as well. Bridget? Uh, this is a, a little bit more of a uh, visually pleasing uh, overview of what that range might look like, including uh, baffles for sound and uh, to make sure that uh, bullets are adequately contained. And finally, uh, a view from inside the, uh, the facility uh, as well. So that, that has gone in um, as our number one priority. We're requesting $4 million uh, for, that, for that project. As the board is aware, the county has already designated $5 million in its ARPA uh, allocation uh, for this project also. Uh, the, the second allocation that we had submitted uh, was uh, for Justice Center security improvements. Uh, the Hamilton County Justice Center, as the board is very well aware, was constructed in 1985, houses about 1,200 inmates daily. Uh, it's the sole jail facility for the county, um, and we know has a lot of improvements that are needed. We have about $50 million worth of improvements needed over the next five years. Uh, the board actually just at our last uh, board meeting approved a, a, an a supplemental appropriation for taking care of some security issues, including uh, replacement of the windows um, and, and some window barricades at the, uh, at, the, at the Justice Center. Bridget, uh, just a high level picture of the Justice Center for those who have never seen it. Um, one of the, the projects that we have is the replacement of the exterior Sallyport doors. So as you can see from this picture, 
The building uh, is uh, circa 1985. These doors look about circa 1918. Uh, so you can see they, they're rusting out and, and rotting out in places and need to be replaced. Um, we also have um, improvements that we've asked for in the total project. All of these projects total one million. Um, some additional exterior security uh, camera installations uh, to make sure that uh, we discourage contacts between inmates and people who come outside the, uh, the facility um, while they're either in the facility or afterwards. Um, as well as to upgrade the security access uh, to the sheriff's server room uh, and the server racking that houses uh, their critical um, uh, IT infrastructure. Um, next steps on this, commissioners. So members of Congress are currently receiving uh, their requests. We have submitted uh, a, both of these requests um, uh, to uh, Congressman Wenstrup and Senator Brown's office. Uh, Wenstrup had received the, the public safety request, the, uh, the, uh, the Justice Center request. Uh, Senator Brown's uh, office has received the uh, Regional Safety Complex request. Um, we've, we know that Senator, or Representative Shabbat, uh, his process ends a little bit later, so we'll be submitting these to his office as well. Um, uh, ultimately, they then have the opportunity to decide which ones that they are going to forward on to uh, their appropriations to the appropriations committee and the subcommittee in the house and in the senate um, representatives are limited i believe to 15 that they can pass along senators do not have a limit uh, so um, we are going to be working with all of our um, delegation offices uh, to advocate uh, for these we don't anticipate we, we do anticipate hearing probably anywhere from july to september uh, whether these have been submitted um, as part of that request, but given the, the prospect for a continuing resolution, um, assuming we are successful with both of these, we are probably not looking um, for an allocation, a funding allocation until early next year. Uh, this is why we uh, wanted to get these, uh, get these in and that these are, pro number one, the, the regional safety complex being a, a high priority uh, that still has some lead time on the project uh, and the Justice Center projects being things that were scheduled uh, in the capital plan for 2023, but which there had been no funding allocated yet to them. So they fit, they, both of these projects fit within, the, within our, uh, our, our timing for implementation. Uh, with that, commissioners, happy to answer any questions, but since we did recently provide these um, through the various application portals, just wanted to make the, sure the board had a uh, brief update. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff. Um, just a couple comments. Um, both of them are very uh, uh, in, gr in great need for repair. And the regional safety complex, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, you said two years, but it's been at least three years because it was, I've been here three and a half and it was one of the first things that I brought up that this was really uh, on my heart that it needed to be changed. And of course, our whole board has um, gravitated on it and it's extremely important for, for both of my colleagues. So it's, it's been a little longer than we, want it but i think it's coming to fruition so that's a great thing um in addition i know as we look at the plan for the regional safety complex i had talked to sheriff mcguffey um and I don't, i'm sure you've talked to her but some of the stuff that was added as a plan for this complex was bells and whistles maybe they didn't need as many lanes as they put in and i'm sure you've talked to her to consult on the need for yeah, thank you, Madam President. That's a good point. So the, the rendering, these were renderings that were constructed um, several months ago, and, and we were also still in the process of building out the budget and trying to figure out what we're actually going to receive in terms of federal allocation, et, et cetera. Um, so ultimately, the sources and uses are going to have to meet. And so to your point, uh, to the degree that this project has to be scaled back or phased even over several years uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that we can hit the, the right number. We'll absolutely take a look at doing that. Great. Thank you. Uh, Vice President Race. Thank you, uh, Jeff, for uh, putting this forward and uh, sharing the process of what we're looking at. These are two critical mm -hmm. uh, projects. We're talking about safety, and we hear a lot of people say, we want to be safe. This is a, these are two major safety programs that are uh, at a 911, our justice center, and, and uh, certainly uh, we heard the call and you put forward and we voted for to get these windows moving. Uh, these are uh, things that we can move on quickly and, uh, and some help with uh, 
you know, starting on the locks and those kind of things. The elevator that was, uh, uh, not our elevator that was broke, but the elevator and the Justice Center, getting moving on those things. So I wanted people who are watching to know that we are moving on these things while we are out trying to get more help. But these are uh, critical, uh, they're critical to the safety. And as we uh, talk about um, the, um, the gun range, uh, and we heard the impact of who is hearing the mm -hmm. shots in Lincoln Heights and hearing them in Woodline. And I think all of us uh, have been, you know, trying to deal with this even in other capacities. Uh, I know President Dumas uh, was the village manager and trying to deal with it at that level at the time. And uh, I was at the state house and trying to deal with it at that time and Representative Driehaus at the state house trying to, but I think the, the I've never seen any traction as the three of us bringing that uh, experience here. Uh, now there's some traction, it's $5 million that this board stepped forward. We are the first to put money on the table um, and put the five million. Need. Now we need more money, uh, and this uh, range is owned by the city. And I know that uh, the city uh, uh, vice mayor Jan Michelle Kearney is helping to lead that. And now there's a new council, and we've got they you know obviously they've got to put some skin in the game too. Uh, and then the administrator, uh, the town hall that we participated in in Colerain Township that had the township there and the trustees saying, yes, we can uh, live with this type of, at least the drawing <laughs> is the beginning and we can move forward with that. And all of the di different complexities of, we had the sheriffs and the Cincinnati police there. Um, I just want to say that uh, it's, it's not moving as quick as we want because every day a, a child, no child should be born and have to, that's the first thing they hear and then grow up and then get desensitized to, oh, that's just the way it is. No, that's not the way it is. That is not how any child should have to grow up and hear these this on a regular basis uh, and it not be illegal. They may have heard it, but it's somebody getting ready to get arrested, somebody getting ready to go to jail, but to hear it at that level, and I think uh, the Cincinnati police was willing, uh, open, uh, and I want to commend you, uh, Jeff, for that. They're, they're at a point where they're open to trying to come up with a solution. So I hope that um, our, our commitment of putting money forward will help. I guess my question is, um, I will just want to say this is, we put ARPA money and there's an expiration date on this money, am I, if I'm not mistaken. Do we have to use it by a certain time? Is it? Yeah, we still have several years and this was ARPA, fortunately not CARES, so we have several years to, to still bring this, uh, to uh, put this money in, I think in 2020, six mm -hmm. we'll, we'll have to spend that money by so we have we, we still have time mm -hmm. to get this money initiated into the project well the reason i'm saying that is all of us have been in other <laughs> we've been in other elected offices <laughs> and and executive offices so for us it's been over that amount of time trying to even get to this point so i'm hopeful that uh we can move this along as you know uh uh, a little fast track. I think all of us are saying that. Uh, but I just wanted to say that it's good to put it in here. I hope that um, our colleagues uh, in Washington uh, will have some sensitivity to the urgency as well as the safety measure uh, of what we're talking about. Uh, this politi politics is off the table now. We're talking about babies and children hearing this. Uh, and we're talking about safety in the Justice Center, so I'm hoping that uh, this can, can move forward. So thank you. And Madam President, uh, to uh, Vice President Reese's point, it's an excellent point in terms of the use of the dollars. Um, I've asked our facilities department and our architect who is working on this to also map out a plan for how those $5 million in funds could be expended to make initial improvements that would be seamless into the broader project when it did occur. So if we did risk losing those dollars, that we find a way to, to make the improvements with our money first and then um, integrate the rest of it when it's ready so that it could be seamless and not be uh, counter uh, and not run counter to the rest of the project. Thank you for that. And Madam President, at some point, um, we may want to have a, I don't know if it's a Tuesday staff, just because so much work has been done. There has been some movement. It's a lot of moving parts, maybe getting kind of an update. Here's where we are now 
and then maybe having you'll be able to present a list of here's where we need to go and maybe here's a recommended roadmap possibly uh, to move there we can maybe Sounds have good. the city part of that or something so everybody kind of knows what's going on in terms of the, the citizens of Hamilton County we certainly can do that for sure Commissioner your hands thank you um, thank you for bringing these forward um, we did I, I we, we did try um, in the last earmark process to get some dollars for the um, regional safety complex and my understanding is we were unsuccessful because the amount was too high, too high. and so we've paired it back um, to four million instead of what was it in the 13. 13 yeah so <laughs> we not that we don't need the 13 uh, we just uh, are being a little more practical I think this go around um, but if we can get this money infused into the financial stack it certainly does get us further down the road you know every other piece is in place including um you know the piece related to Coleraine township so i am hopeful that this will go through this time and that we will be able to count on the federal government to be a partner because so many other agencies utilize our gun ranges whether it's the cities or the counties uh, and so we'll continue to pursue that money but um i i am grateful for this and i I think maybe we all can advocate to mm -hmm. Senator Brown um, and Representative Shabbat and Wenstrup as to the importance of this particular issue, in addition to the jail issue, which we all know is critically important too, related to the safety of the inmates and the deputies uh, and really the broader community um, with that project that, that's in this too. So thank you for bringing this forward and um, we will all do our part to try to advocate for this one. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I wish on our uh, support letter that we sent, if we could have sent the, the video along with that little four-year-old that they showed on the screen when we were at that hearing in, in the city hall with him holding his ears, um, if that could be an attachment. I, I think we support. have included that as an atta attachment. In oh. fact, the, uh, the request through Senator Brown's office this year uh, requires that the the project have a web page so we have a a, a web page behind the scenes um, uh, that just includes all of the project uh, stuff and included in that is media uh, related to the gun range including that particular video awesome and, um, and uh, I'm sorry go ahead right. and but lastly I wanted to thank my chief of staff Bishop Hilton because on his first day I think here I said your first assignment is the Lincoln Heights gun range, which we don't call it Lincoln Heights anymore, which is awesome, but the gun range. And he coordinated a lot of things to get it moving and rolling. So I wanted to publicly thank him for that. And Madam President, I also just wanted to mention, I wanted to thank our partners at the Ferguson Group. Uh, they're our federal um, lobbying partner. Um, they do a lot of great work for us, including helping out with both of these projects and not even just these projects, but the work of of going through all the federal spending accounts and helping us understand what's eligible and what's not. Mm -hmm. And then once we realize what's eligible to the question about how much should we apply for, they went and did the digging on on what was the uh, amounts that were allocated to individual projects last year so to help us understand how much should we apply for. Then they actually did the took the laboring war of getting all of this submitted uh, over this past holiday weekend. Uh, to make sure that this was all uploaded into into the various portals, et cetera, and they continue to help us with that. So I just wanted to say a thank you to them. Great, thank you so much. Okay, we're thanking a lot of people. They're working. Everybody's working really hard. We're doing a lot of work down here. Whoever's watching, we're working for you, uh, making sure your tax money is being spent appropriately, and we are invested in you. Um, so um, that's our last um, item on the agenda. At this point, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. Commissioner Summer Dumas? Yes. Commissioner Reese? Yes. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes. Thank you.